that both of it bordering uh, guy sewers and uh, what are you breaking now? And this guy too. <laughs> okay. Um, so does it really work? Is it really like the microphone on? I mean, I kind of get the impression that I'm yelling here. But I mean, I'm fine with yelling, but it's, there's no, there's no videotaping or anything that's where the voice would matter, right? There is videotaping? So we should make it work? It, it really works? OK, so. Um, um, you want to hear yourself, right? <laughs> yes, I want to hear myself. Anyway, so uh, yeah, what, what are we breaking now? Um, um, we're going to talk about that today. Um, we, we, we sometimes got from Red Hat Management the, the request to communicate more in, in advance um, what we're going to do. And so we're doing that now. Um, we usually didn't really like doing talking too much about our plans because, uh, um, I don't know, I, I've seen many talks in my life um, where people talked about plans that never took place. And so we always thought it's better about talking about what you actually did than, than what you planned. But we can understand, of course, that people want to know what we're actually doing and planning that. So um, yeah, we actually, actually only got five slides or something, or seven, actually, if you count with the introduction. So um, we'll mostly just talk about the topics that we'll bring up here. We only got 45 minutes, so we're not going to be able to cover all the stuff here anyway, because um, I kind of hope that we get a discussion going here. Um, so instead of us just talking, uh, we want to drive it into the direction that you guys want it to go. All right, so let's get started. Is everyone fun? Yeah, it's about fun, right? <laughs> Why you came here, I presume. So yeah, um, to make this very clear in the beginning is uh, what our goal actually is here. Like, I mean, we, we don't pull these, these topics out of our ass for no reason. Our goal is actually, we want to make Linux the modern general purpose OS. Uh, and that means basically bringing it up to the level of, of Windows and of Mac OS and of Android and all of these oper op other operating systems. Like um, fixing all the, the, the missing bits, like filling all the missing bits that, that they have that we don't have. Because we genuinely believe that Linux should be the one operating system um, that everybody uses. And uh, so yeah, if you, if we, we, we then of course always um, analyze what they have and what we don't have, and then we try to fi fill the gaps. Um, and that includes the whole range, like from the supercomputer to your phone, basically. I mean, we want to have the building blocks to build stuff that can run everywhere, like the Linux kernel. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's a full bandwidth, a full uh, range from, from very small, like from, from embedded devices to mobile devices to desktops to servers. Um, no, no other operating system can, can uh, um, cover all of this, and we can, and we should, and our kernel can, and so should our user space in the same way. And the problems that show up on one end of the range very frequently end up on the other, are useful on the other end of the range as well. I don't know, there's random, like quite a few examples of that. For example, watchdog support is something you want in embedded hardware, but you want in higher availability service as well. And there's a lot of things like that where you suddenly something that's uh, useful on the desktop ends up using useful on the server or something that is useful on the server ends up being useful in embedded or mobile. So um, yeah, our goal is we want a Linux uh, to be the modern general purpose OS. Also, yeah. we're just getting started. I mean, we, we made some changes in the, yes. in the past uh, years, and um, sometimes people say, think we are too fast with that. And, uh, many people hope for it. It's <laughs> and it many will people not, hope it will for not slow down. So. Slowing down, but it's yeah. not. I, I mean, the thing is, like, if you look at the other operating systems, they are in many ways, in many areas, uh, way ahead of us. And uh, the way how you, you, you get better than them is not by slowing down, it's by getting faster, because they will not wait for us. So um, to make this very clear, um, we still have a couple of things in our list that we need to do. And um, we will continue pushing them. And we will, we will make it happen. We, we really want to go and, and make Linux this universal thing. So yeah, um, we're going to continue to be fast. OK, so the first topic we want to talk about is predictable network naming. Um, this is actually already in progress, right? The, the other stuff we have there um, is not yet really in progress, at least not publicly. This is um, already implemented in Fedora 19. It still has a um, couple of rough edges, but it's, it's mostly there. Um, I don't know, do you want to? So, yeah, in, in the past, we used to write out rules persistently on disk when new hardware was added. So in the hot plug path, we created, we tried to create persistent names and write that to disk. And if you reboot it or whatever, put the disk somewhere else, whatever, it 
caused problems all over the place. And what we do now is basically a very simple thing that we use the topology, like the physical device path to the device and create a short name for a network device. It's kind of ugly, but it's like BIOS DevNAME worked, but not like BIOS DevNAME worked. That is the model BIOS DevNAME did. So, yeah, so we try to make it very simple now, and it's predictable. So basically, you can look at LSPCI and compose the name in your head if you can like convert hex numbers to decimal numbers. And so it's it should be very easy, but it will cause some whatever trouble for people because it's different, and we had never had a naming scheme like this for network devices before. So yeah, to, to take, uh, take a step back, the reason why predictable network names <coughs> are actually something you want is basically because uh, traditionally in Linux, all the network devices had these names, ETH0, ETH1, and so on. And these numbers were basically um, not predictable because they were assigned in the order the drivers um, probed the hardware. It's one global counter in the kernel, which depends on whatever, how you initialize the kernel. So, which basically meant that as soon as you have more than one network device, it could be like every second boot could come up in a different order, and that's really problematic if you want to write firewall rules or, or listen on, on certain interface cards. So, yeah, this is, like, a, as mentioned, this BIOS name, name thing was something that was introduced in Forest 16, I think, and um, we kind of just moved this down into, into UDEF um, proper, because in UDEF we already had these, these uh, symlinks for, for block devices, uh, which allowed to, to reference a block device um, via various different um, schemes, like, for example, by the, 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 the serial number of the file system on it, or by um, the pass, the, the actual USB PCI pass that it stays fixed, and a different, uh, in a couple of different other ways. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, with, with this predictable network naming, inter uh, interface naming stuff, we'll just duplicate the same thing for network interface. It's a little bit more complicated there because we can't have sim links on, on network interface names. But yeah, it's... Uh, we have it for many other subsystems too, like USB TTYs, input devices, video devices, they all have the same scheme. So yeah, this is just, just about fixing like m the, the last missing gap where it's actually one of the most important um, cases. And this um, one will definitely fit what we are breaking now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this, this stuff will break things because the network interface changes name, uh, change, at least if you, if you upgrade the system and remove BIOS dev names. Um, of course, the general upgrade path is not to do that and, and just continue with it's BIOS still dev names. Com it's still <coughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we'll try to, we, we're trying to I keep mean, it low, but. Existing configuration or the existing installed BIOS dev name will not change many of the names, but if you don't have it, if you install a system, you will have different names, and you will not have ETH something. Okay, so and your firewall rules will go. I yeah. mean, if you copy just the config from the firewall over and not, yeah. some, it will, some stuff will, like, cause problems. And uh, to be frank, sometimes the new interface names will not be as pretty and easy to type as they were before. In most cases, they should be. But the thing is, is uh, we use um, like the numbers, like the fixed numbers of the device pass for by default. And for example, for USB Ethernet devices, which are probably a little bit exotic, I mean, the most service people probably will not plug a USB um, Ethernet device into their machines. But um, yeah, they can get relatively long, right? There's this, this, it's a series of U's and P's and numbers, and it's not necessarily the prettiest thing to do. But it's it's a price to pay, and then in, in the most common case, like if you have built-in uh, network um, uh, cards, it will be kind of pretty. Yeah, okay. But you can change the name of the system. Hmm? Can you push the parameter into the no, you can't. The there's no, no there's no ability. That's what I mentioned earlier. There's no sim links. Like you want, according to. I mean, you can always have custom config to give interfaces like red, green, or internal, external, and BMC. Or I whatever. mean, this is something we generally recommend anyway, right? Um, that, that people, instead of relying mm -hmm. of the default We recommended names. that in the past already. So if you yeah. have that, that will still work. And that was never a problem, not even in the past. The stuff we do here is that stuff out of the box can work, and which can't work if you have ETH. So what we try to do is that every reboot cr creates the same names, regardless of what you did to the thing. The biggest problem was if you wanted to rename ETH5 to ETH1. Okay. Yeah, that is gone. You cannot do that again. No. By the way, are there mics for them, or should they just no, talk? <laughs> but I'm. This is tied to me. Yeah, just just. We'll repeat the question. So, um, if you can't rename the device, 
advice would you share as an aspiring young player to do? Maybe you find that, yeah, you can, but you can't have multiple teammates for the same device. Is there a plan to do that at some point? No. Too? I mean, this was discussed over and over and over again, and um, no. Why not? Because it's hard and the kernel, the kernel is not designed like that. It's like I mean, people have constantly yes. suggesting that, but it's 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 uh, not going to happen. I mean, that that's what we know. I mean, the, the guys from Dell, the bias Dev name tried. Um, it went nowhere, and I have no idea of how to do it because there's a lot of assumptions about if the one single name in for an effective device, you can have one alias string, but this is not used in the kernel to look up things. So it's totally different from Simlinks because Simlinks is just an abstraction happening in the file system. But yeah. So they would have to invent all the stuff again for in the entire network stack and they have firewall rules have like a asterisk just to match them ag against stuff. So you just use the different name and then you get different firewall rules and you <coughs> open, them, open a huge pile of problems with yeah, doing that. Right. So, so this is not a real, there's no abstraction for an equi equivalent at that level. So. Okay. Right. Sure. I mean, we have that anyway, right? That, that in UDEF, all the network interfaces um, include information like the manufacturer, like pretty names, and then uh, um, network manager actually uses them and, and shows you not something bullshit like EM something, but will show you um, Intel um, E1000 and pretty string or something. So if you're using the BIOS name, uh, is it compatible with supporting the different names? BIOS dev name overrides what we do. If it's installed, it takes over the names. So th that's for so compatibility reasons. Basically, if you have BIOS dev name installed before and after, nothing will change. If you have custom config or BIOS dev name, nothing changes. So you can easily disable all the naming, but then you get unpredictable names. There will be no try to I mean this keep ETH012 stable in any way. This stuff is optional, right? You, it, it's on by default, but you can opt out of it. Can it stop the name from being Yes. It, it solves a real problem. OK, let's go to the next one. We don't have that much time anyway. Um, so everybody loves Grub2 configuration, I think. <laughs> It was so not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? So, and it's, uh, it's actually a script that searches something on your box, creates a script that runs inside the bootloader at boot up. No, no, it's even more complex. It's a script that parses a script that generates a script. That, that's <laughs> honestly, it's not that, that's really what Grub2 currently is. So yeah. and we try to dump that down significantly and like just install a snippet with the installed kernel that is read by the bootloader. And we have a reference implementation for that. There's a scummy boot. And we have a patch in Fedora Grub2 already to read the same snippets. But we are working now at converting the kernel install facility to create these snippets. So <coughs> in the future, if you install a kernel and remove a kernel, nothing will change for the bootloader. Only the snippet, like a tiny file that looks like a Grub1 configuration snippet, will be placed in the slash boot partition. And the bootloader will read it and recreate a config entry for the manual. So, so, so basically, um, we, we looked at the Grub2 problem, and um, we, we had some implemented something nice on Gummiboot. And so we ripped out the interesting part, the inst interesting logic out of Gummiboot, and made it generic and added it to Grub2. The effect is basically that you know, with this and with this specification in place, with this patch in place that is, as mentioned already in Fedora 19, um, what we can do is is the the, the Grub2 bootloader script will still exist, but it will basically be static um, after the installation. And then everything else is just done with, with drop-in files. So things become much simpler. Um, you don't need to run scripts that pass scripts to generate scripts anymore. Um, or at least you just uh, have to do that once the after. Bootloader the configuration will not be a program anymore. So. Yeah. And, um, and uh, this has a couple of other benefits at the same time, because this actually is um, like part of the specification is finding the place to put the kernels and uh, inner RDs in the first place. And this is done cross distribution. So the effect is, is that if you have multiple distributions installed in the same system, they will actually drop the kernels and inner RDs into the same directory, which has the benefit that, that uh, when the bootloader initializes, 
it can actually find all the kernels and all the init RDs of all the distributions and will show them automatically in one menu, which solves this problem that if you currently do multi-boot, let's say, between Fedora and RHEL, I mean, currently, all the distributions always fight around who gets, uh, gets to sit in the MBR, who gets to be in control, and then these distributions then try to find all the other bootloaders and add them too, but uh, you can't update, the, update those anymore and you're fucked if you'd install another distribution. So with this new scheme where we have these drop-in files, we make things more robust and also much, much nicer for multi-boot scenarios. Um, this also has impact on a couple of other things because um, on uh, newer laptops and new machines, you always have these UEFI um, um, biases. And they have this thing that they don't want to initialize USB anymore during early boot, like, right? So, so if you have a USB co uh, uh, um, keyboard connected to your machine, um, you will not have the ability anymore um, press any button. to press any button because um, it's not going to be initialized. Because initializing USB takes like a couple of seconds and they want to go through, through, through um, the entire post in, in, in less than two seconds. So given that we have this problem that many desktops will not have the ability to, to get in the, in the BIOS anymore, and um, not have the ability to get into the boot menu anymore and actually select something. Um, I mean, on many laptops, it will still work because on laptops, uh, for my, uh, frequently the keyboard is connected via IT, AT, uh, via the classic AT um, cabling instead of USB. Um, but this is a this is a, a fundamental problem. So, so if we want to ever to allow multi-boot, then we need to come up with a scheme how you can can boot into the other operating systems you've installed without having to go through the bootloader, which is not accessible in general. So um, what this basically means is we need a nice way how UIs, maybe the GNOME shutdown button or something like that, or, or some GNOME configuration applet thingy, can actually figure out what's actually installed so that it can uh, click on something and make it the default, or just click on something and boot into it once, right? So, um, but figuring out what is actually installed is really difficult right now because you basically have to parse it, that stupid <laughs> script that Grub2 <laughs> generated. Yes, you would have to run the program to get the real effect, and that is illusionary. So for us, VM, um, so coming from this thing. side of things, it is really, really essential that we have a sane way how declaratively instead of imperatively, um, the kernels and then the NDRDs are discoverable not only by the bootloader and not only by the installer, but also and by normal user away. space so that they can show proper UIs for this. So it's kind of burning with the UFI issue. And it's, it's more like an unfucked grub than breaking <laughs> something. So yeah, this will hopefully um, clean things up. And as mentioned, we have this implementation in wood anyway, and we have, a, have this patch for grub, but the specification is entirely generic, so people can implement this for other bootloaders as well, for example, for this Linux or whatever else they want. They're um, wor working on syslinux already, so, but it takes a couple of years, I think. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's our goal um, to get this adopted by all the distributions. We sent this around. So far, we didn't get too much feedback. Um, from, from the other distributions, but uh, um, this would, like, if, we, if, if everybody adhered to the spec, then multi-booting Linux would be really easy, and everybody would exactly know how to find the boot partition, how to find those kernels, and um, all the user space could, in the same way, figure out if there's a SUSE installed in this world, or the Ubuntu, or whatnot. Next question. Of grab, yeah. you know, with these pictures, like with this, this right. fireworks and shit. I mean, you know, Grub2 oh. does all kinds of nasty stuff, right? Initialize graphics, loads fonts, um, gr gr and whatnot. Like, I, I honestly, I think uh, one could just say that Fedora doesn't use all that bullshit anymore and just uses the, 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 the few modules that actually make sense, which is basically like, like find the, the bootloader spec snippets and bring the menu on screen, end of story. So, um, uh, Don't show the menu at all. But honestly, I mean, Honestly, yeah, and, and the, the other thing is we shouldn't show the menu, right? We should show the menu if you press a button or something like that, or, or we should n show a menu if something went wrong with last boot and these kind of things. But um, showing this menu yeah. by default for three seconds if we actually want to go for boot below one second is kind of bullshit, right? 
it's, it's, it, it just, just needs to, to, to go away. So, um, yeah, but, but we will not fix Grub in journals. So the, the, right, the I mean, we have no interest in hacking Grub, you know. <laughs> it's like, I mean, we did the, we did the, the patch because, I mean, I, we can talk as much as we want if we don't have anything to show. So um, we did the patch, but don't expect us to, to become Grub2 hackers. <laughs> Beyond that. So EFI, it's easy. You can boot without any bootloader or use Gummy Boot for EFI, but for MBR, there's Sys Linux, basically, and Grub1. For Fedora, there's no, pa no, no plan to use anything else. I mean, Gummy Boot might be an alternative way out, but. I'm pretty sure we should not enable background images. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it should just, I mean, it's a fucking bootloader. <laughs> it's like, you don't want to see that stuff. Um, yeah, anyway, are there any further questions on this? Otherwise, we go to the next one. There's a question. So but this specification is completely generic, right? Like any bootloader can implement it and it's not specific to x86 or anything. I mean, we have implemented on UEFI for x86, like for, for any system and for, for, for Grub2. So e UEFI is taking over <coughs> on at least the bigger boxes too and all the new stuff Intel works on, like the mobile 32-bit platforms that use EFI, it's the same thing. So I don't know, people could put that into U-boot or whatever and they're always using if yeah. they want to. I mean, sooner or later, everything is going UFI anyway. Like ARC, like the, the ARM 64-bit stuff is all UFI, so. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's not very complicated. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really like the specification is, is, is on purpose kept very simple, and it, it, to make it palatable to, to most people, it's, it's like it's very close to the Grub1 configuration snippets. Like it uses the same keys and same syntax and everything. So, so just to make this as acceptable for everybody. Um, so uh, yeah, let's go to the next topic. Um, kernel debus. Um, kernel debus is something uh, um, that has been attempted two times already and failed horrendously two times. And we're not trying the third time, but we are going to succeed. Um, <laughs> so everybody knows We don't debus. have any code, but it will succeed. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the reason why the first two attempts failed was mostly politics. It's like uh, um, current politics are, is, uh, politics are difficult, and uh, the guys attempting it didn't really give it the, 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 the politics part, the, 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 the right amount of uh, um, love. love. And yeah, and when we did, they right? They didn't even <laughs> listen. <laughs> I mean, they didn't even listen to our good, good uh, suggestions. But um, I, we, we, we think we, are, we got our politics right, because we got Greg Crowhardman on our side. So, and if you have Greg on our side, then we get everything into the ground. <laughs> Basically, um, so kernel debus. I mean, everybody knows debus um, that it currently uses uh, requires a, a user space daemon debus daemon um, for the system bus and one for the session bus, and that's kind of annoying many in many ways. Like um, one of it, of course, is that all the administrators see that daemon say, "Oh my god, I don't like debus on my server," um, and then they, uh, have, they have such voices. Yeah, <laughs> all administrators speak <laughs> like that. And uh, so if we move into the kernel, they won't even see it anymore, right? But um, <laughs> There's, there's, the, there's, of course, actual benefits of doing this. This is just bullshit, right, that, that it's not there anymore. Like, like for example, um, you, remove, uh, you remove a lot of complexity because you can actually initialize, uh, set up the bus already in the in RD, and it will continue all the way through, through the system, and will, like, it will be the last thing that goes down because it's in the kernel. Right now, we have this problem that dbus daemon starts relatively late, and then we tear it down again. Like, in the NRD, we currently don't have dbus. Um, and, and, and it has all these kind of problems. So um, yeah, we want to make it um, available all the time. And then it um, solves a, like, like Dbus is currently only useful for sending control data, right? small messages that, that tell other applications to do something. But you cannot actually use it to send payload, like real data, like a JPEG file or something like that, because it's not designed to be like that. It's like uh, to be used like that. It's like, a, it, it would be slow because it, you would serialize everything to a socket and then you pull it out, everything out of the socket and you validate it and then you write it back into a socket and, and if you have substantial data, that's really not what you want to do. Um, so with the KUS stuff, um, 
things are going to be much nicer because we can because it's a kernel thing we can do all kind of copy and write and then these kind of things. Um, so so um, basically, if you if you send some, something over the bus, in the best case, it will just be mapped into the receiving uh, side, and uh, yeah, it yeah. will be more uh, secure and more. And Um, uh, it, it's because like you, you, like the next thing that we're talking about is applications basically, and the thing is like uh, we want to be be uh, to to have k debus or debus to be the primary in and, and way, way in and way out of the of the of an application sandbox, right? Because um, the other nice thing is that as soon as we have this in the kernel, we can attach kernel policy to it, right? So that the kernel will do do can do auditing and can do all these kind of things um, without any user space interference. So given that that is uh, how it is, that we have this nice policy in the kernel, and the kernel can supervise it, sure. we want to, to have it the primary way in and out of the application yeah, sandbox. And, and for that, we need it to be able to not just um, do control stuff, but um, because I mean, uh, otherwise you always need a side channel. Like you always need to some side channel, like, like, a, like a file descriptor passing or, or mm -hmm. like a reference to, to something in the file system. But that's explicitly not what we want. Because if you do file, system, uh, um, file descriptor passing, you open up a whole new set of problems because if you if you pass a file descriptor over, then the then the sender can still modify the data on disk and confuse the receiver. While side. you are reading it, so file descriptors are inherently unsafe. You cannot pass file descriptor over trust boundaries. It's oh, impossible. I mean, you can do that, but it's you shouldn't do that I because mean, it's, it's you, you cannot make impossibly. It safe. There's no way yep. to make it safe. safe. So yeah, if you if you sort of put this all together, then you say, okay, let's make our, make our stuff simple and just say dbus is the only way in and out, but that also then means we need to, be, to, um, to make it um, um, on, highly, on lockdown boxes, dbus will be part of the trusted platform thing it, because it's inside the kernel, like as in Linux, all the audit stuff can actually look what's happening and it's getting part of the trusted layer because it's in the kernel. Because it's, because it's because no. it's not generic. It's, not. it's so it, it will it will <coughs> inherit it will inherit the very semantics that are currently defined for Dbus, and we will we will relatively easily make it possible to move everything that's currently on Dbus onto this. It uses the same marshalling format, or not the same, but it will use basically um, the, the same marshalling format. It will use this the system with object paths, interfaces, methods, and this kind of thing. They will stay the same. So you, most of the tools will just continue to work, and they don't care if it's implemented in user space. And uh, the same libraries will be uh, will be able to speak the old protocol so that you can do it via the network and whatnot. But we'll also do the the, the new stuff locally. So right, um, yeah, it's it's very much Dbus, and d we will c call the kernel Dbus stuff Dbus because we really want to make clear this is the semantics that Dbus defined, and not some other semantics like binder or whatever else IPC you want to have. And it's more specific than sockets. So <coughs> it's not another raw path from one thing to the other. It has really built in the basic building blocks of Dbus, like the named connections, the well-known names and the unique names and all the stuff is happening inside the kernel now. So it, it's easier to name, name, give it a name and not let people think they can port whatever their idea of IPC is on top of that. So, so you're asking about the, how we well, how we're going to adopt it? If we have that in the base OS, you cannot boot without a kernel supporting that. But that will happen like. So basically, to keep our stuff simple, we will say that yes, um, system D version 200, whatever, will require this in the kernel. And, and if you have used an older kernel, it won't boot. The the, the way how we want to make this palatable is by saying that the KDBus stuff is very, very isolated from the rest of the kernel. That's also, I mean, we need to do that anyway for the politics uh, politics part. We, we can't really modify the kernel to, to use KDBus. So our suggestion there is this, is that we can make it backportable, right? Very nicely backportable because it doesn't integrate into the kernel. Yeah, there will be some boundary where we not can't, where we can't get back. I mean, we already have that today, like whatever is it. 3.2 kernel, basically. But I mean, you, we usually try to, to, to support like the two year, last years or something with systemd, like the two last years of kernels. But um, in this case, um, yeah, we probably, I mean, doing that entirely in two ways in user space would be a really huge amount of work. So we probably. But 
the, the kernel dbus part will look like a device driver, basically. It's not hooking into any existing subsystem. It's the raw kernel interfaces for device drivers. Just I mean, we, we have... It's basically our next thing. <laughs> it's the next thing we work on, but we have no idea how long it will take. We hope it will be get it working this year, but, it's, uh, but there is definitely not going to be any. I mean, we might have code in there if some, something happens, but we will not use it. And, and it will be a, like like a step by step process, right? Like like first we'll get into the kernel, then we'll um, move system the this is the system bus over to it, and then later the, the the session bus over to it. So it's 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 something we can do bit by bit and learn from it and and, and revert it if necessary. Because we want something reliable and we want something that does uh, copy and write and we want something. I mean, if you have a local IPC, you have this nice functionality that you can actually know that the, the other si side is still there. You can watch the processes. We want to have implicit information about processes, user IDs, group IDs. We want to have implicit auditing and these kind of things. It's like um, um, multicasting with, with real network protocol is never reliable and you can't really make it reliable. You could and we deadly. want it reliable. Okay. So we, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very different thing. It's, it's IPC is not networking. It's a, it's, 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 you cannot just take any remote protocol and apply it locally and it would be useful. You just can't. Um, and there's, there's tons of things like that. I mean, the closest thing would be Netlink. So. Uh. It's going away. It's it's going to go away. The naming service is going to be implemented with ioctals, and the kernel is going to, to, to maintain the name registry, basically. And dbus daemon and user space goes away. I mean, we might keep it for a while, like, like as a stub thing to resolve those driver methods, if you know those, like the, the ones, the method that actually the bus itself implements, and, and uh, because some apps actually invoke them directly so that we can't just turn them into ioctals. So we might keep some stubs thing that is acti activated only when needed, and, and it will only be activated as long as you have some legacy applications running. But we might just do that. We and it will not involve routing of messages. So yeah, it, it, it will, will just be the stub thing that is there for compatibility to, to implement a couple of methods. It will, won't have any purpose. It's, it's going to be tiny and, and stupid and just translate messages into octals and back. Yes. No. Why do you want no policy kit is here to stay? There's nothing that could replace it. You want interactive authentication, and that's what policy kit is about, and it's not going to go away. Um, we will move authentication into the kernel and move it closer to how we do authentication. Otherwise, like it will be more like like I don't know file system ACLs. So we you but it will be dumped down from the current logic. The current logic is very. I mean, nobody can write policy uh, files for Dbus right now. It's it's absolutely insane language because you can you can actually. I mean, there have been security holes like like where apps still just copied the policy of some other application, got it wrong when they patched it. So we want to really dumb it down and, and make it more uh, understandable. But the the old system could like apply policy to individual functions like method calls and interfaces and these kind of things. And that's that's going to go away. It's just going to be access control based on service names. Well, policy kit is a different, is a, solves a different problem. You have a privileged process and an, an ordinary user talks to that process and the, the privileged process is doing something on behalf of the user. Friend? I didn't get it because I was speaking. <laughs> It's something like there will be a security policy uploaded to the connection to Dbus, yes. But it's, it's not going to be comparable. But to it, it cannot solve the problem policy kit solves because policy kit involves like active thing going back into, the, into your user session and the kernel cannot like get I mean into your user session. We will improve things for people to, to <laughs> actually make policy kit more, more easy to use because currently if you want to use policy kit in, in, in your service, then what you do is you get the message then you extract like uh, the connection name 
of the one who sent it to you, then you ask the bus in another message, so what's the user ID, PID, and other parameters of this user, then you get the answer back from the bus, then you send this to PolicyKit, and then PolicyKit answers to you. And this is just, just insanely complex. Um, so what we do instead is like, all the KDVS messages will implicitly include user ID, group ID, and all that information, all these kind of things, and as a Linux context and these kind of things. And so, so you can just take it and pass it directly to PolicyKit, and PolicyKit will respond to you. So it's going to be simple. But to make this very clear, PolicyKit is here to stay. I mean, it has a purpose that cannot be implemented just in low-level stuff because it's interactive. And I mean, somebody can replace PolicyKit, but it's not DBus. So my, our goal is to make it as, as least painful as possible. Um, I mean, when we started, we wanted to keep the semantics, like with, the, with brainstorming here, we tried to keep the semantics as close as possible. But uh, as, as we did this, like all people involved with Dbus then said, oh, could you please break it here? It's so stupid right now in this area and stuff like that. So, but it's still, it's our goal to make this as easy as possible. So our primary goal is to, to make it possible that applications that can just continue to run, like you don't have to recompile. Our second goal is to make this also happen for services, where it's already a little bit harder. And, and then there are a couple of other things. But the, yeah, I mean, the marshalling probably is going to change a little bit, but thankfully nobody actually looks into the marshalling. Everybody just uses library, uh, or the three libraries that there are. So, um, yeah, we expect breakage, but we try hard to not make it. So servers or frequent. stuff that offers things on DBus might need change. Um, especially if they're auto-activated. So um, we only have like five minutes left anymore, then let's quickly go over the other things. Systemd in the user session, we probably don't have to talk too much about that. I mean, people have been doing this like all the time already. It's like if you, if you, if you like look at those mobile phone vendors like, like Tizen and like, like Mea and these kind of people, they always, and, and, the, and the car people use this, they basically run the same systemd code that manages the system as a user manager, as a service manager for your, your desktop session. We want to do the same for the general purpose desktop as well. So basically that GNOME session goes away and gets replaced by systemd, and um, the other des uh, desktops could do the same, like you remove KDE session, or what it's called, and, and, and use the same thing. Um, what we gain through this is, um, Things will get faster. Right now, right now in, in, in boot up, we can boot up the the uh, the, the, the kernel in, in one second a little bit. We can boot up the inner ID in less than a second. We can boot up the user space in a second. And then it takes eight seconds to initialize GNOME. And that, of course, is, is not really um, acceptable. And so one of the things that we can make it faster is, is using systemd, because much of the, of the stuff that made the boot faster also applies very much exactly the same, same way to the session. <laughs> so, um, but we gain a lot of other stuff as to, to there because like, I don't know, reduces memory footprint because it, you can actually share, share the code in memory and these kind of things. Um, so this is our goal. Um, yeah, as mentioned, like uh, all kinds of embedded devices or mo mobile devices already use this. Um, what's still missing is like, I mean, we, we hacked it up like already years ago or something to the 90% to make this happen but the difficult 10% are still missing to go and patch into GNOME and uh, extract from GNOME session all the parts that we need uh, um, and only use systemd for the parts um, where GNOME se session is just the service management. And we currently have that blocked on having the kernel debus ready because it's kind of a same change and we don't want to do it twice. So, so yeah, um, hand in hand goes um, the apps thing. Uh, this is a big, big topic. So um, there was this meeting in, in right before FOSTEM um, with the GNOME people in a developer experience hack fest. And it was like one part, one big thing we discussed there was basically getting apps right on a, on a Linux. It's, uh, yeah, we, we currently still have the problem that, that uh, people tend not to write apps for, for Linux that much. I mean, we have our own. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, so uh, um, we have this general problem that uh, that the people don't write apps. Don't interrupt them. Like all the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, that we have all these 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 gigantic app ecosystems for Android, for iOS, nowadays even for Windows Metro, for 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 the real Apple Mac OS too, and uh, he's just starting. I'm, I mean, this is a huge topic. Actually, <laughs> I could talk. I could do another talk about this, but uh, we'll just do the ten minute version um, now. Um, so uh, we sat down. And like we, we had analyzed it for a while what Metro, what the others do there, and we figured out we need 
same thing on Linux too, because um, I mean we, we want our ecosystem to succeed and be the one big one. And uh, if we don't have a sane app story, then we don't have an ecosystem, and this sucks. So um, I mean, we should probably explain that that uh, like current Firefox can read your SSH keys um, unless uh, he's fixing it for us. Uh, <laughs> That's what happens on our system, and this is just a joke for an operating system. For like, a, you sit in front of a, like your desktop, and you run a web browser, and it can read all your private data. I mean, we cannot allow that 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 if you download some Firefox image from the internet um, and just run it, that it could do anything on your laptop, um, access any like your address book, your emails, your everything. And you, we cannot allow that. We need to isolate these kind of things. It's absolutely essential for for everybody that 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 this kind of stuff works. So and without Dan, <laughs> everybody would have that. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, it's and so we don't have the building blocks to solve the problem today. What's that? As a Linux, um, I mean, it's it, it's definitely going to solve a couple of issues in this in this context because it can um, um, fix more security holes that that we'll have. But uh, as a Linux has has inherently a, a, a persistent policy that that Red Hat writes, that Fedora writes. And then it's uh, it's basically only lists all the apps that Fedora ships, right? But this the app stuff. The story here is is basically it's about desktop apps that you can download from the internet directly from the vendor instead of having to go through the distribution yeah. all the time. So Linux is more like saving our ass instead of part of a core part of the operating system how apps should work. So it saves us from doing bad things, but it's not the core part we build stuff upon. I mean, we fix stuff not to do the bad things they can do today. But it's more like after the you have the application, then it's to go and look and fix the stuff that the application doesn't do the bad things. But this is not how operating systems should work if you like have the freedom to change them. And also, I mean, as a Linux doesn't solve all the problems, right? Um, as a Linux cannot really um, 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 add more policy. Like it cannot be have more fine-grained policy than at the process boundary, right? Like LibreOffice is this gigantic thing, and uh, you have to protect it as one thing. Like you have to, to attach one label to it and allow it access to all kinds of files as, as one object. But one part of the apps thing is actually something that we call the portals, which is a really nice name, um, which is basically, it's about, um, you run LibreOffice, for example, in the sandbox, and then the user wants to select a file Traditionally, this means, okay, LibreOffice needs to access to your home directory so that it can browse the files and the user can select something. That, of course, is a huge security problem because, as mentioned, this would allow Firefox to access your emails and all these kind of things that we don't want to, to do. So uh, with the portal stuff, what we'll have, basically, there's going to be, be tiny debug servers where the application can go and have a description of what it wants to do and then passes that to the system and says, please do this, like browse these files for me and give me back some answer. Then there's going to be this basically this transition, like the primary transition out of the sandbox into some, some, some other operating system defined thing. That will select the file and will return the file, like the actual contents of the file back to LibreOffice. The effect is um, LibreOffice does never have to have access to the, to the home directory and will just get the, 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 the files basically mapped then and can just use them. Um, now the nice, this is a little bit like, like the Android's intent system, if, if anybody ever looked into Android's. It's intents are different and solve different problems, but it's inspired by this. So uh, the interesting bit about this is that, that these goals are inherently interactive, right? So it's always that, that LibreOffice, you click the file open dialog uh, button, and then you get an interactive dialog where you can select the file, and this basically means that it's always the user who has to okay something, which is much, much better than the other security solutions where, where the user gets asked, so do you want to allow LibreOffice to open a file? Because that's a bullshit question. Everybody would be trying to just press yes. But in this case, what it actually will do, it will just pop up the, the file dialog, and if the user didn't want to do that, then he just presses cancel. Now this, 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 so yeah, you basically have this interactivity there which, which hides the fact that this is actually a security um, transition. And, and pretends to be just an integration thing. So it's, yeah, it's, it's both, of course. And it's actually a feature that LibreOffice doesn't know what happens behind the scenes. So it, you really transition to a different security domain at that point. So the stuff, the file browser that it runs is a different application, for, uh, but LibreOffice has no idea what's going on. Yeah, and this not only applies to file browsers, it applies to quite a few things. Like in Android, for example, there's, there's one of these intents <coughs> that you can take a picture from the camera. Right, so so you uh, you have your Google Plus application. You press a button, then it does a transition out of the sandbox, starts the camera application. You you, you then interactively again 
do one, one photo, and then returns a photo back to the Google Plus application, right? And uh, uh, so we will have the same, of course. Like, if you want to take a picture, then you do it this way. Um, and then there's a couple of other things, like access to the address book and these kind of things. <coughs> we will have not, it's not the same thing, but applications will probably come with the manifest. So the application will basically list what they all can do, but our intention is that the apps generally cannot access your home directory, but always go over the, the portal system. But, but the current Android stuff is kind of pointless. So that's that's I mean, everybody fine. agrees that the current Android thing doesn't really work because it asks you questions nobody can answer and everybody just says yes to. So um, I don't know, the GNOME designers, I mean, I, I honestly believe this is, a, this is a question primarily for designers. They need to phrase, like, they need to, 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 to expose these difficult questions in a way that people understand. Um, the GNOME designers believe they can do this. I, I personally have a couple of ideas there. I'm not going to implement them because I'm not going to care about how the, they present that. But for example, what I could think what might make sense is that we have like a, like, like we, we for, for depending on, on what kind of policies the apps require, we do something like a traffic lock system, right? We say red if it's a really dangerous thing that wants access to your home directory and, and whatnot, all kinds of, of really dangerous things. Well, but it, but yeah, well, but, but the, the, our goal is basically that LibreOffice only goes via portals and never re requires access yeah, to the home directory. Yeah, but but the idea is the, the idea is basically to, to to give the user an impression. Like uh, how 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 um how, how much it exposes. So it could be like yep. categories. So you I can mean, tell the application can reach your internal network or only the internet or something. So. Well, it's a, it's a philosophy, it's a psychological thing. It's a psychological thing, and if people understand that, oh, maybe I should be, hmm? But anyway, let's not discuss this now. Let's not discuss this now. It's not my problem. I will not care about it. It's a stuff for the GNOME designers. Discuss it with them. Shut up. <laughs> No, it's, it's not part of our stack. You know, so we're talking here about the stuff that we do and the policy stuff, the actual like uh, how to expose it in the, in the market tool or whatever, like the app downloading tool, it's not our problem. Like what we cover in, in systemd basically is not even the portal system. What we cover in systemd um, of all the app story, like the all app story um, consists of like eight different steps like one of them being KDBus, one of them being app images, one of them being app sandboxes, one of them being portals, one of them being how you build these things and a couple of other things. Um, if, you, if you look through the entire stack, then these two are the ones, or, or with KDBus, of course, these three then will be the part that, that, that will be done inside of systemd, where the code will live. Um, the others are, are going to live either on free desktop projects or in GNOME or in KDE, if KDE wants to adopt that. I mean, we, we, we had this meeting at, in, 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 at the, the DX Hackfest in, in Boston where we discussed this, and, and we have been discussing parts of it already for quite some time. I figure our time is basically over, but just. Sure. Sure, but, but um, I mean, but we focus on, oh, it's the building blocks of it, so it's not, we, we, we don't even have any of them now, so it's, kind of doesn't make sense to like figure out how the user interface should look like or something. Our own applications so will work the same way. I mean, the thing is, the thing is progressive, but we believe that the that the RPM packages are not the answer for everything. RPM packages are basically um, um, like we can prepare them as a distribution, right? But um, it is impossible for for normal vendors to ship out RPMs that work everywhere. You just can't do that because you need to know the versions you rely on. You cannot never ever test that, right? Because they are like a gazillion distributions who ship packages in a different combination of versions, and, and it is illusionary for application. That's the reason why they bundle. Yeah, that's 
I mean, the thing is, we believe that RPM. Hmm? Yeah. I mean, our time's over. Just the one thing. We believe that RPM is a wonderful thing, but it uh, doesn't solve everything.